deal with such issues and uh, problems my students should be able to even uh, become somebody who can who is capable of helping others in terms of emotional well being sati is an integral part of wellness center we have several curricular courses that been offered now one is called happiness habits and success we also have strategies for professional growth so that a student can seamlessly move from a campus to a corporate we do that in parts and other courses we also have one single course that offers this in future we also are thinking of courses on relationships one of the key issues that students of current generation face is about relationships we are looking at creating an ecosystem where it is possible for them to engage themselves in several activities so that they feel confident about themselves there are opportunities for them to be in, in, engaged and involved that makes a huge difference in terms of well being of the students Hello and welcome to the 29th IDES webinar titled Quantum Analysis under the cluster of Mathematics and Cybersecurity. My name is Ujwala Koti and I work for the Office of Global Engagement at IIT Madras. Our speaker today is Dr. Kunal K. Mukherjee from the Department of Mathematics. Dr. Kunal is an associate professor and his interests include von Neumann algebras and ergodic theory. and also operator algebras also joining us today as panelists today are uh, professor um, sumesh k um, who works in the department of mathematics um, professor sumesh is um, interested in operator algebras and quantum information theory professor aprameen p from the department of mathematics His interests are analysis on symmetric spaces, representations of real Lie groups, and geometric quantization. We have a special guest tonight, Professor John P. Bannon, who is the department chair and professor of mathematics at the Siena College, New York. Professor Bannon's research interests are operator algebras, unitary representations of groups, and ergodic theory. He is a recipient of Fulbright Scholar Award. Lancaster University United Kingdom for the year 2018-19 Professor Bannon likes to teach modern algebra and real analysis Professor Bannon we extend you a special welcome to our webinar series tonight over thank to you, Dr Mukherjee uh thank you thanks for the introduction and um, thank you John for uh being agreeing to moderate but you are the moderator of our private webinars every day we all know that so we are so i'm starting to share my file uh okay so our center under the institute of eminence support by the government of india is termed as center for quantum analysis so many of the uh, viewers who have heard the name quantum in many different ways but for a non mathematician let's say to say the word analysis doesn't mean to analyze anything and anything uh, everything analysis means our efforts to access the infinite so there are a couple of phrases in mathematics one is to access the infinite that is calculus or analysis one is algebra the art of manipulating symbols one is geometry the understanding of shapes and so on uh, so it is on this uh, cluster of ideas the uh, many of the fields of mathematics actually join hands as wings together so it's just now an analysis but if you have to place us as faculties in a math department we will be regarded as analysts uh, as hardcore analysts in some way so so why this center uh, so the so the center means it is a center of teaching and learning where students uh, from all over india even outside participate faculties also participate and uh, postdocs come and go uh, so in that way 
uh, we hope that someday this center becomes a center of gravity of this kind of subjects here in India, at least. And uh, the areas of focus uh, inside this uh, circle of studies are, uh, can be broadly made into three clusters. And these clusters are like, depending on the expertise of uh, we people, those who are involved. And so the first cluster is geometric scattering theory, quantum and classical resonances, micro local analysis, geometric quantization in Lie theory, branching problems on Lie groups and orbit method. That's what Aproman is actually expert at. Uh, so the next cluster is with sister and von Neumann algebras and their representations, sub factors, free probability, quantum groups, Hilbert system modules, positive and completely positive maps, completely bounded maps, their semigroups and dilations. So that's where both myself and uh, Sumesh has common, uh, common interest. And the third one is unitary representations of groups, ergodic theory, dynamics on manifolds, group actions, and relations to the representation field of Lie groups. So where maybe all three of us have a common intersection, but that's the way to put it. Uh, okay, so here are the quantized people in this quantum analysis center. So this is Dr. Okromian P, my colleague. As I said, he is specialist on analysis on symmetric spaces and representation of real Lie groups, geometric quantization. So I do operator algebras and Schumann is sitting next to me. So he does operator algebras, operator theory and quantum information theory. Okay, so the word quantum means many things to many people. Even when talking about money, people say, what is the quantum of money in world? So for us, quantized people here, the word quantum means especially dealing with Hilbert space operators, as was the dream of von Neumann. <clears throat> okay, so there is no, the reason behind all of this is it is well understood that operators play a significant role in all of science and matrices and operators essentially rule the planet. There is no, no subject in mathematics or even outside of it where this kind of things, at least in physics mostly, let's say, where they do not have a role. They have a role all the time, even in finances, businesses, and so on. We are starting to hear about quantum computers, but people have moved ahead. There are quantum bio biology, quantum chemistry, quantum economics, what not, this keeps on going. So they are real. So it, it's breadth of application is immense. It, it's possible, not possible for a single person to actually say what it is. But the point is the reason of doing that is despite all of that being true and India being a hub, I mean, a developing country, I mean, we are a nuclear armed nation. Despite that, we have a smaller hub of operators and scattered people here and there inside India. We don't even know each other sometimes. So this, this thing and the critical mass of people doing the subject has to change. So it is that purpose in order to uh, reach there, uh, we want to change. And this is one of the things that colleagues in the overseas enjoy that by drive, making a drive of two hours, they are, trying to, they are able to find a collaborator and we here have to wait for uh, flying overseas. Okay, so there are lots of talent in India, undoubted, but this ta talent needs to be told how to channel, channelize their mind and what exactly to do. So this is an effort, this is a glimpse of the subject we are going to say. Uh, a bird's eye view of mathematics is actually not possible, though many people think it because it's quite technical. And uh, we know that without such teaching and learning center, which we are lagging now, we are going to be outpaced with others uh, in the scientific world. So this is what we definitely not like. So of course, one of the reasons that the institute or the government force, I mean, uh, us us to do these things is to have a global visibility that will definitely be uh, possible, I believe, we all believe. But the kind of mathematics we proposed here are done precisely for its own beauty. I think John is going to say, say a few lines of that because our only reward is being trying to place the last QED on the blackboard. That's what we want. Okay. So <clears throat> now as an inspiration, like what makes me drives this kind of things, 
So I was once a postdoc in Institute of Mathematical Sciences where uh, Professor Masamichi Takasaki, he's a stellar expert in my domain. He came to give a series of talks sort of as a Vajra faculty where he was explaining algebraic, uh, the relation between algebraic and analytical aspects of matrices. And the point is, why, what, what he was saying is already known to us, but he was trying to emphasize its importance so hard that he came to say, so this is, uh, this is the same, this, this picture here is the same place where he's lecturing and I am there as an audience. So he says, the waves of operator algebras will reach all shores, shores means shores of the subject. It is you young gentlemen who should make this happen. Okay, so he is one of the leading pioneers behind the subject. And he really requested many people like, keep moving, we have to do something about it. And it's really true that we have, in, even in the recent uh, la latest month, I have seen a paper of operator algebra being referred in quantum programming, quantum uh, computation, programming of quantum computations. So this is where it is coming close. Okay, so the first operator, so what is an operator algebra and who is behind it? So the first operator algebra is known as a von Neumann algebra. It was uh, noted down by John von Neumann and uh, engineers know his name more than mathematicians actually know because he's the man behind the computer. He's the electrical engineer by himself. Uh, and in his effort to lay out rigorous foundations of quantum mechanics, he wrote a series of four papers, which we call as the Old Testament. So everything is here. Uh, and then he was himself, he could not push the theory to a certain extent because of technical gap, technical problems. So he even commented to his friends that I don't believe in Hilbert spaces anymore. And this is a letter to Barkov. But nevertheless, people shouldered his effort by 1969, uh, people were aware that operator algebras play a very significant role in describing some of the uh, phenomena in physics uh, that has got to do with gravity. So they are used in, uh, they, they are used as algebraic quantum field theory. That's the name of the subject. And they play a very significant role where certain new objects that appeared was not known, no, known to von Neumann. That's why he said that I don't believe in Hilbert spaces. Okay, so one of the main, let's say issues with this subject is, this is not taught in master's class, maybe even in developed world. The reason is it stands on four subjects, algebra, analysis, topology, and probability from the very basic beginning. And you move a little higher till where the subject came until 1980s and so on, geometry starts moving inside. So it's all entangled in one subject. That's one of the reasons it's very difficult to put it as a core course or electives uh, subject in a master's class and especially very tough inside India, but still nevertheless, its importance is uh, monumental. Okay, so I just give you very, very basic glimpse. I'm not going to speak much technically because it's too technical. If you want one line, what an operator algebra study is all about, you should regard it as, as some sort of calculus. Maybe the correct adjective would be non-commutative calculus uh, for those who understand the term. And those who don't understand, maybe you can put it notorious calculus. Notorious in a positive sense because it will give very close answers to some of the physical phenomena. So suppose you have a Hilbert space, all are complex and let's say even separable. Uh, you have algebra of operators inside M, uh, which is closed undertaking adjoints. That means it's closed undertaking sums, products, and the identity operator of M is inside that algebra. So then that algebra becomes a von Neumann algebra when it is closed under the topology of pointwise convergence. Not convergence is a norm. It's a weaker topology under which this algebra is closed. Now, what is one of the fundamental examples are MNC, the essentially bounded functions on a probability space, bounded operators or any Hilbert space, 
These are the first examples that one can even give in a first master's class, if at all it is possible. Beyond that, the examples will turn out to be complicated. So the non-trivial examples come out as left regular von Neumann algebras of left regular representations of discrete groups. And then we have to play games with algebras like introduce tensor products in place of direct products, group major space construction in, replaced with semi-direct products, uh, amalgamated and free amalgamated products of algebras replacing those with ideas from groups, read products, amplifications of algebras and so on. So that's the way to construct one after another. Now, what are we reading here? So we have read about N cross N matrices. Here we are reading of T cross T matrices, but T runs through a continuous parameter. Now, that doesn't mean that the operators now uh, are defined on a T dimensional Hilbert space. Yes, it is, but that T dimensional Hilbert space in terms of vector space dimension would actually be an infinite dimensional space. That is essentially what is quantization. Okay. So uh, these algebras are models of what people in field theory call as algebras of observables uh, uh, in AQFT or quantum physics. Now, one of the most important class of von Neumann algebras to concentrate is on the irreducible ones. These are called factors. Those which do not have center, I, I cannot split them. The same is the reasoning in physics. Physicists want to know what is the most irreducible object in nature. They come up with smaller and smaller particles. We want to know what is the most irreducible object as algebras, they are known as factors. So there is a back and forth. Now, von Neumann algebras can be thought of as non-commutative major spaces. I showed you an example. That example is L infinity of a major space. Now, they are grouped into three fundamental types, one, two, and three. And there exist notions of finite, semi-finite, properly infinite von Neumann algebras, mimicking the definitions of finite, semi-finite major spaces. Properly infinite von Neumann algebras are those which we have not seen right now, or it's difficult to give a model, but they are the guys who really come to play a role in physics. Now, if you want to know what are factors, type one, the list is complete. B of H, all bounded operators on a Hilbert space, one for every dimension. Then the type two breaks up into two further components, two one and two infinity, two one representing some sort of a non-commutative probability space, the two infinity representing some sort of a non commutative semi finite probability space. And then there are other complicated objects, quite notorious, but yet very beautiful. Type three, which breaks up as type three lambda, lambda in zero one. That's it. So the modern research focuses on type two and three, and uh, the type three because of its relevance in physics. Now, what we do here is there are many things to study. This subject is quite huge. We have studied mostly maximal abelian subalgebras in von Neumann algebras, which is an abelian object sitting inside a giant non abelian object. Now, the way to do this is just as mimicking the notion of groups and subgroups, you define a normalizer. Similarly, over here, between an algebra and a subalgebra, you can define a normalizer. These are all unitaries which twist the smaller algebra A to A itself. So that's a group because these are unitaries. There are three kinds, and this is stunning. It's not obvious to realize these are three kinds. The first time it was realized in 51, it was like a wow. Okay, so the one is the first one is known as Cartan. This is also related to the concept of maximal torus in Lie algebras. So that, that's the one for which this group is the largest, the normalizer generates say. The second one is known as semi-regular. That's the class for which the normalizer is a moderate size. Then the third one that is singular means the naughty guys. Singular matrices are singular things are always naughty. So there's the smallest size possible. Now, even though, so, the, so these three areas of research are currently quite active, last 20 years, let's say. But what I have focused on mostly is on singular masses. Now, even though they are, they are written here in terms of an algebraic description, they are actually capturing some part, kind of a dynamical uh, information within itself, which is not, which is a little difficult to say. So I put it in the cleverest way that I can. So they are more random objects inside. So they, they count to some sort of a weekly mixing component 
of a non commutative dynamics. So there are very strong characterizations with this and the ergodic theory counterpart. What we did is we constructed very exotic singular masses uh, in my past research on what are called free group factors or the left regular representation of free groups with prescribed properties. Then we tried slowly pushing and are currently pushing this to von Neumann algebras which arise out of young baxter deformations or Q deformations of the canonical commutation or anti-commutation relations. Okay. These are pretty complicated objects where even but the basic first property under in this investigation of whether something is a factor turns out to be pretty tough to solve. They are not known in full generality. On the recent study, recently we just realized that we have to study more of speed inclusions. This means intermediate type one factor sitting, which blocks the understanding of the studies of factoriality in this class of examples that I saw about. So these are all cousin brothers of each other in terms of algebras as we move. But when we move from LF2 to the next one, the complication becomes more, the complication becomes further more when we move to the young Baxter things and so on. Back in ergodic theory, my collaborator John here with him, we studied massively joinings of W star dynamical systems. So these are comparing group actions. The same group will act on two different algebras and the actions are supposed to be conservative in the language of physics that is preserved in some state. And we want to compare them. So this is a very important study in classical dynamics. And we have been quite successful in pushing this to the non commutative case and we'll keep on pushing further. So with that, I will hand on my baton to Aproman and he'll run from here. Thank you, Kunal. So uh, I'll so briefly uh, share the screen first. So say something which is uh, related, but uh, with a different uh, emphasis, and where geometry actually plays a role. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I'm not able to see my screen. So let me. Puzzled for a little bit here. But okay. So. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll give a very quick and uh, impressionistic view of uh, what quantization is with an emphasis on what is geometric about geometric quantization and briefly describe a couple of problems that uh, I have dealt with in the past and I intend to deal with in the, as part of this uh, uh, circle. And uh, so the key part here is uh, that so what a classical system so you take a classical hamiltonian system where uh, you, you have an even dimensional smooth manifold with poisson brackets and uh, a hamiltonian there and uh, so of course the example to have in mind is simply r to n with your uh, coordinates x1 to xn and psi1 to psi n and the Poisson brackets given by these uh, classical objects here. And uh, the uh, energy, the, the Hamiltonian here, is given as the sum uh, of the kinetic and the potential energy. And uh, so, so there is, of course, quantization in its essence. What does it do? It takes uh, functions on one side and uh, relates operators to it. We'll see in a moment that it has to satisfy certain specific criteria here. Uh, so what you do is here, take a smooth function on the manifold and you associate a vector field to it. Yeah? And so vector field is defined as uh, given slightly below. And the non-degeneracy of the Poisson bracket is of course uh, related to the non-degeneracy of uh, the symplectic form. Right, so we have 
we sort of move on therefore to the quantum classical correspondence so those are the classical objects so we quantize it and get to the quantum side so what is this so it is just a correspondence from smooth functions with the the lie algebra of smooth functions with the poisson bracket to a hilbert space and the commutator there and this is given precisely by these uh, what is written over there so a uh, function f is taken to th of f and uh, this is a the self adjoint operator and we demand that uh, it satisfies these commutation relations yeah and uh, so typically of course operators don't commute yeah so so satisfies its uh, commutation relations and that the uh, you know the, the function is identically one really goes to the uh, identity operator and finally that uh, this whole family is irreducible family of operators yeah so this is what uh, one would ideally like to have however it was shown very early on i think even in the late 40s and early 50s that such a correspondence is simply not possible even in the simplest of examples like r2 here with the usual uh, bracket so that is where geometric quantization comes in and what geometric quantization does is the following so it sort of remedies much of the problems which arise in the ideal uh, ideal situation that we want and how does it do it is in the following way so associated to the symplectic manifold you have a natural hilbert space which is the l2 space as written out over there with the you know with a with respect to this measure which is written over there and you look at these operators which is f going to i h bar of x f so these are self adjoint operators now of course you immediately see that uh, one does not go to identity so what you do is you add f so that now one goes to identity yeah, yeah as the operator but now of course once you simply do the simplistic thing you lose out on your commutation relations and uh, this is where geometry actually first enters the picture so what you do is you add a geometric correction term and this is related to a symplectic potential theta so of course in the r2 an example that i had over there the symplectic potential is very easy to write down in general of course symplectic potentials exist only locally and this is of course part of the issue so how is this resolved is uh, a certain integrality condition has to be satisfied so the obstruction to the symplectic potential existing globally lies in the second integral cohomology class and once this is satisfied then there is a line bundle with a connection whose curvature is this uh, what is written out there in terms of the symplectic form yeah correctly normalized and the associated uh, space of l2 sections of this line bundle is the pre quantized space now of course the first two problems are taken care of however the problem of irreducibility is still remains because this pre quantum space is simply too large for things to be uh, for operators to act irreducibly and so what happens really is uh, here comes the next important geometric idea you don't take all l2 sections but you only take those which are covariantly constant so you have a connection so you take the covariant derivative with respect to that and these are called the polarized sections right so of course this is uh, the same as choosing a maximal abelian subalgebra of the poisson algebra uh, I, i so in the example so if you take the r2 with the usual uh, poisson brackets the line bundle to be the trivial line bundle then the pre quantum space is l2 of r2 uh of course the potential is what it is the symplectic potential however what is the quantized hilbert space here it, it is those which are uh, whose derivatives uh, with respect to psi are zero and so this is of course isomorphic to l2 of r right so you don't go to subspaces because there are still problems with these no go theorems right so uh what happens really is the quantized space becomes l2 of r right so so that's the sort of very quick uh, overview of what some ways in which geometry enters and sort of saves the situation so from our perspective and uh, so i'll briefly describe a couple of problems uh, so the unifying theme of all these is essentially that the quantum and classical correspondence so there are objects on the quantum side there are objects on the classical side and there is a way to go from one to the other and part of the exercise is we will try to establish these and in our situation always there is a very large group of symmetries acting in our case is sort of uh, uh, non compact real semisimple lie groups so these are so 
So one of the first themes that we dealt with is to uh, deal with quantum resonances and scattering poles. Uh, so we established a precise correspondence there, uniformly for all rank one uh, symmetric spaces. Yeah. So, and uh, one of the advantages of our methods is our uniformity, which comes from the application of Lie theory. Uh, so that, so this roughly you can say this is the region of spectral geometry where one wants to study such correspondences uh, on more general spaces. Yeah. So, so let's say even locally symmetric spaces uh, where the, so there are actions of these groups. Yeah. So, so finally, I sort of mentioned that uh, many of our problems really concern unity representations of Lie groups. So one of the uh, themes is, of course, uh, planchial type decompositions for homogeneous spaces uh, using methods of geometric quantization. And here I would like to point out that Hadamard's uh, classical maxim that the shortest path between two truths in the real domain passes through the complex domain. And this is really expected to play an important role. Uh, the other uh, component of studying unitary representations from our perspective is, of course, understanding unitary reducible representations and restricting them to subgroups and see how they branch. Yeah, this is the branching problem. But for uh, rather interesting classes of subgroups, for example, parabolic subgroups, right? So these are not very well studied and they are fascinating. Of course, part of this is to elucidate this sort of quantum classical correspondence in some way using the moment map between co-joint orbits and harmonic analysis restrictions. There are many strong conjectures in this, long-standing conjectures in this area, and uh, I think we, uh, some headway can be made there. Yeah. So with that, I would like to sort of uh, sum up and fin hand over to uh, Sumesh. Yeah. Okay, I'm Sumesh, uh, I'm another co-peer of this center. So my main interest is uh, mainly on the theory of completely positive maps in the context of quantum analysis. So what are completely positive maps? The completely positive maps are a special class of linear maps between Caesar algebra. So let me just uh, tell you what we mean by Caesar algebra. So Caesar algebra, you can think of it as closed star subalgebra of B of H, where by B of H, I mean the algebra of boundary linear maps on a Hilbert space H. Now, in a Caesar algebra, we have the notion of uh, positive elements. So you can look at uh, linear maps uh, between Caesar algebras, which sends positive elements to positive elements. And such maps, we call it as positive linear maps. Uh, we are not interested in all positive linear maps, but we are interested in a special class of positive linear maps, namely completely positive. OK, then why we want to study completely positive maps? So in physics, uh, it is, uh, the physicist has been already argued that uh, CP maps are physically more meaningful than just positive maps because of their stability under amplification. And uh, the theory of CP maps has found lots of application in quantum mechanics, in particular quantum information theory. And from the posit, uh, point of view of uh, mathematics, uh, W. Arverson and other algebraists, uh, in the beginning, they quickly realized the importance of the theory of completely positive maps. And uh, this theory of completely positive maps are great importance in the theory of uh, Caesar algebras and fundamental algebras. Okay, now if you look at CP maps from other point of view, one is the quantum probabilistic point of view, you can think of completely positive maps are quantum analog of stochastic or substochastic transition probability maps. In classical probability, we have the notion of a Markov process or in particular Markov chains. So if you want to look at the non-commutative or the quantum analog of these Markov chains or Markov processes, one has to study completely positive maps. In fact, you have to look at semi-groups of uh, quantum uh, CP semi-groups, uh, and they are called quantum Markov semi-groups. Okay. Recently, there has been a lot of uh, interest of the theory of completely positive maps uh, in quantum information theory, and it's one of the uh, art, uh, one of the important uh, concept in quantum information theory. So in quantum information theory, the 
quantum channels, uh, the role of quantum channels are played by a special class of completely positive maps, namely trace preserving unital completely positive map. So my interest uh, in this uh, aspect, quantum aspect is the theory of completely positive maps in this context of quantum information theory. So why I are in interested here? So it is the notion of entanglement actually brought me here. So what is entanglement? So entanglement is a primary feature of quantum mechanics, which is not there in the classical mechanics. So an entangled system, uh, you can define as a system, physical system uh, whose quantum state cannot be factored as a product of states of its local constituents. Okay, so this is the physical point of view, but I'm not interested in the physical aspects of the theory, but my interest is mainly on the mass mathematical aspects of this notion of entanglement. So if I do define what is entanglement mathematically, first of all, I have to define what you mean by state as a mathematical object. So as a mathematical object, uh, states are positive trace class operators. Uh, most of the time we'll just consider the Hilbert separable. And uh, it's a normalizing factor that uh, the states we think of it as uh, of trace one. Now you can look at uh, the set of all state space, uh, uh, which are the class of all states on the Hilbert space X. Now, uh, if you want to study multi party system in physics, uh, most of the time that is important. So if you want to represent them mathematically, it's natural that you have to consider tensor product of Hilbert spaces. So it's natural that uh, one has to look at uh, states on tensor product of Hilbert spaces also. But unfortunately, if you look at uh, states on uh, tensor product of Hilbert spaces, they are not given by uh, tensor product of states on the individual Hilbert space. In, in fact, something more is also not true. Even if you look at the convex combination of this kind of symbol tenses, even that also will not give you the uh, states on the tensor product of Hilbert space. It's not necessary that you have to consider two. If you want to look at uh, uh, more particles, you have to look at even tensor product of more than two Hilbert spaces. Okay. Now, so uh, what do you mean by uh, a separable state? So a separable state uh, uh, is mathematically, it's a state uh, which can be written or approximated as a linear combination like this, pi, a tensor, bi, where a, i, and b, i are states on the individual Hilbert space, h, and k, and pi is a probability distribution. Okay, And there are states uh, which are not of separable kind, and these states are called entangled state. Now, from the physics point of view, it's uh, important that given a state uh, to decide whether that is separable or not. Okay, so uh, there are many ca equivalent characterization of separability and equivalently uh, entanglement uh, uh, in the financial setup, which are given by M. Horodowski and uh, other others. Uh, but even though there are many various equivalent characterization known for entanglement or the separability, the, th the problem of deciding whether a given state is separable or not is a computationally hard one. And in fact, uh, this uh, difficulty makes the theory challenging and at the same time, it's interesting too. Okay. And the another important notion uh, uh, of uh, important notion in quantum information theory is the notion of quantum channels. So what are quantum channels as a mathematical object? So in quantum information theory, most of the time you have to look at uh, financial Hilbert space in order to consider infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And as a mathematical object, uh, quantum channels are represented by unital trace preserving completely positive maps. Okay. And there are special class of uh, quantum channels which are of great importance in quantum information theory. They are PPT channels and endon breaking channels. So what are PPT channels? PPT channels are those uh, channels uh, which has a positive partial transpose. And what are endon breaking channels? Endon breaking channels are those uh, channels phi from B of S to B of K, which has the property that given any natural number n, if you look at the tensor product, identity n tensor phi, then this map has to send every state into the separable state. That means including the entangled state, the, all the states has to go to separable one. Well, that means it breaks the even the separate notion of uh, entanglement here. Okay. Now it's known that uh, uh, all EB channels are PPT channels, and by definition, PPT channels are CP or in, in, in fact, uh, quantum channels. And uh, we already mentioned that uh, quantum channels or in general CP maps are special class of positive maps. Okay. Now from the pole, again, from the physics point of view, it's important to know what are all quantum channels or in particular, what are all EB channels. So in other words, uh, one way to study the structure or one way to understand the structure of EB channels, PPD channels, quantum channels in general. Okay. So in fact, uh, in 1955, Stan Spring uh, has already obtained a structure theorem for the CP map. That means he completely characterizes how a CP maps looks like. 
and uh, in 1998 uh, all of uh, give a complete uh, structure theorem for eb maps uh, in the financial setup and later in 203 horodoki shor and ruskai they given uh, even very sequential characterization of eb maps in the financial setup okay so uh, but if you look at the other classes like the ppd channels and positive maps unfortunately they are not uh, understood so far because the structure even though they are studied for a long time the structure is still not understood completely even in the financial setup okay so what we are interested so we are interested in mainly the structure and various algebraic and convexity properties of this class these kinds of classes of maps and uh, in particular uh, we have a special interest in the theory of eb maps so recently uh, we have obtained some uh, research in this direction and uh, one more thing i would say that even though uh, eb maps the characterization of eb maps are known in the financial setup given a C, uh, given a quantum channel determining whether it's a eb or not is in, again it's a hard problem like we already mentioned that deciding whether a state is separable or entangled is a hard problem so the same difficulty makes uh, determining eb maps also difficult but uh, irrespective of that uh, because of the physical importance this uh, eb maps are studied mainly in the financial set to a great extent but uh, being a mathematician, we are not only interested in the financial setup. We are also interested in the, even in the general theory of EP maps. That means one way to look at even in the infinite setup. But uh, there are not uh, many studies of uh, EB maps or uh, separability in the infinite there, Even though there are little uh, pro uh, progress here and there, th there is not a great uh, achievements uh, done in this direction. For example, <clears throat> okay. So this is what uh, our aim. So we will have to study the. Uh, this kind of classes or uh, in particular the eb maps in the infinite set okay so this is what all i want to say now i'll hand over uh, to uh, uh, kunal uh, to control no, no, the full no, no, statement no, yeah. so okay so uh so uh, we are to we have already got got a couple of questions where people were asking of books how to get in what to do with all these kind of things so the point is uh, the the we are looking what we are looking for and what you should be looking for as well if you want to students want to uh, do all of this so we are looking for train uh, students and postdoc by training we mean we, you are at least trained in the master's level because as i said this thing doesn't begin uh, even at the last semester of masters uh, in an honest way uh, secondly what you uh, who you should be like what should be your test as a student in order to do all of this you should have strong motivation for analysis. Uh, so all I'm saying is that these CP maps, matrices, uh, uh, quantization, geometry, this, that, and so on. We have said many things, but at the core, it is all mathematics. Uh, this is all about analysis or calculus uh, in many ways. And you should be a lover of what is this epsilon delta group. So here is Barry Simon with his crucial tools, epsilon and delta, and that's how he portrayed. If you have to be part of this game, there's no way you should be thinking of not to deal with epsilons and deltas. It's a very, that means I have said you what you really need to know, analysis, complex analysis, harmonic analysis, operator theory, functional analysis, some bit of linear algebra. So all, when you know all of that, this is what, major theory. So when you know all of that, you will be start beginning to see some sort of, you, you have reached the first summit, you will start seeing where things can begin. And uh, the easiest way to get in our department is through the PhD program, because uh, we do not have a small projects after or before masters. Uh, so PhD and postdocs are really the things. And some people asked about books. So the book says that uh, have a glimpse of what you should know about all the subject. There's a book called Functional Analysis by V.S. Sundar. I intentionally said an Indian name because this book will be easier for students to purchase by within 500 rupees or so. So you can have a glimpse of what things are before you uh, start thinking about doing something in this side. So with all of that, I'll now just say John to say a couple of minutes about what we have reported. Thank you, Kunal. I'm uh, very impressed by what I see here. The, the subject of non-commutative geometry and operator algebras is vast. 
So there's a lot of places where you can put effort and there's a, you have to make careful choices when designing an institute um, for approaching these problems. And um, I'm impressed, I'm very much impressed to see that you guys have chosen areas of uh, substantial impact. All three of the talks that I've seen today aim at um, very important central breaking points for, um, for research. Uh, the study of types, the, the study of uh, joinings, and as we know, the study of operator algebra is improper, and the, uh, this this connects to basic connect basic problems about gravitation and about the even flow of time itself. And we are we're studying these type three von Neumann algebras and factors, although they're in infinite dimensions. The thermal time hypothesis comes directly out of a natural time evolution of these factors. This is a quantum phenomenon. It is not, does not appear in uh, classical physics. So if you want to understand the flow of time and potentially entropy in nature, you have to come to grips with infinite dimensional quantum field theories, as you mentioned. Secondly, the, the, the idea of uh, geometric quantization, absolutely fundamental idea. That the idea that you can uh, sort of glean some information about the quantum world, which Quantum geometries, by definition, have no points, so you can't localize measurements. You have to have some way of understanding them, but we don't want, you know, there's a joke that, you know, somehow we made a deal with, you can make a deal with, the mathematician makes a deal with the devil. The devil says, I will give you algebra, but you have to give me geometry. And um, this is a quantum, uh, quantum, um, <clears throat> A geometric quantization seems to be a way of sort of skirting this deal with the devil, where you can somehow get an idea using geometric ideas for understanding um, quantum systems. So this is a vitally important uh, approach. Finally, last but not least, these quantum channels are directly the modern standpoint on quantum physics. If you're learning it in a physics department, for example, no longer really goes hand in hand with the Copenhagen interpretation but instead is about quantum information theory and about these quantum channels are the fundamental objects for understanding quantum physics now. If you want to learn about that, there are many online uh, books about quantum information, quantum coding, and these kinds of things. And they're directly connected with computer science, the breakthrough work of the past year showing the, well, it's just still under a little bit under review, but showing that the Kahn and Betty conjecture is actually false, has a direct impact on the study of operator algebras um, because and, and also quantum information theory at the finite dimensional level. Interestingly, what that precisely says, it goes back to these um, entanglement and entanglement bracing, breaking questions. For the longest time, physicists and we have believed that you can use finite dimensional systems to model quantum correlations in the sense that you can look at finite dimensional matrices and looking at larger and larger and larger systems of those, you can model all possible entanglement set scenarios. This result of the past year of Kahn's, Kahn, Kahn's and Bennett conjecture actually establishes that that's insufficient, which is remarkable because most of us as a physics, physicists believe, when you're, when you're a physicist, you believe that the universe is a finite place. So it actually is not necessary to think about infinity. Infinity is just a useful fiction. However, now, with the falsehood of the, of the kahn and conjecture, we know that it's absolutely essential and necessary to work in infinite dimensions, not just as a tool, but as like an essential core of reality. So even understanding, uh, we have to understand infinite dimensional theory of quantum channels um, as well as finite dimensional theory. So this is, a, this is a, an important and will be a fruitful frontier in the 21st century. So I'm very impressed that you guys have chosen to work putting your effort and aiming your firepower at these three areas. And um, this is excellent. I'm, I'm very uh, impressed with the quality of what I see here. I guess I'll pass this back to Kunal and think since you guys have other questions or uh, comments from you. Yeah, thanks, John. So uh, we have to take a couple of questions. Maybe the, the most of the people, they are asking the question. The, the questions are re relevant with respect to books how to get in here or somewhere else. Uh, as I said, so I, I answered that question and many of them, I mean, many probably will be satisfied. If you have to begin, the first beginning is with functional analysis. Without all of that, nothing will happen. So if you have not taken, if you are MSc first year, 
or planning to do all these kind of things, it's better you go for a functional analysis course. And uh, you, you go for a functional analysis class because uh, that's where everything will actually begin. There is no easy way of climbing the Everest. So it's not that after the end of the course, you can actually begin. As you have seen, John was saying, there are many different bridges one has to cross before you will see start seeing the light of the day. Uh, so <clears throat> a course in operator theory, a course in functional analysis, and that course in those courses in your schools will have automatic prerequisites with all of that, you can actually start beginning uh, to see something uh, in, this, in, in, in this horizon. So that's about the preparation and most people are asking about the preparation. I have told the name of a book, which is Indian, written by an Indian author because I, all the names I see asking the questions are Indian. Uh, so it will be easy for you to buy or even downloadable from his website. It is Professor V. S. Sundar, Functional Analysis. And once you know that book, then you can probably start uh, beginning somewhere. So if there are other questions, we see another question. Other, I mean, the, all the questions are centered around the same thing. So. Okay, so I, I think that is, yeah, we expected that only because this is a math thing. So most people are asking what are, what are the sources? Okay, some other questions are what are the scope of careers here? You are mostly uh, going to be a mathematician because you are you will be getting rigorous training uh, to deal with infinite dimensional objects, sometimes finite dimensional too. Uh, so there are also scopes of people doing quantum entanglement and all, uh, probably finding a job in industry because uh, that's the current, current sort of uh, target for people in the technical world. So there are some scopes uh, in that regard, but mostly, mostly you are going to be a researcher in this uh, field. And that, that's even our hope that when some people from students become researchers, they become our masters. We, we, we learn from them. That's the way the thing goes. Uh, so, right. So most of the questions are clustered around that. So, uh, John, are you seeing some questions that? I see some questions. Do you want me to, I can pass some forward. Yeah, you, you, you can pass me and I'll try to answer. Okay, well, uh, this is, uh, there was one here that I'm trying to, I'm scrolling through. There was one that I would like to see the answer to. Oh, I see. This is a question about geometric quantization. Is, is geometric quantization the same as fractional order quantization? I don't know the answer to this. So, uh, someone... Praman, can you answer that? I don't know either. I don't know what fractional order is here. So I've never fraction. heard of that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the essential thing, as I mentioned, is somehow you the, the symplectic geometry which underlines classical systems comes into play, uh, and you know that's the central point. So uh, yeah, I really don't know the answer to that. So usually, fractional would mean taking some sort of a fractional part of the Laplacian or something on your yeah, yeah, fractional derivatives. Right. Yeah, so that, these that, sort of things can be done, of course. You know, you have calculus of pseudo differential operators, so which right. deals in a much broader class of than merely fractional powers. So, of course, those, those are part of, uh, or more generally, even Fourier integral operators. And uh, for Fourier integral operators, of course, geometry becomes much more important. The Lagrangians have manifolds and so on. So. And uh, yeah, so, the, so in that sense, I suppose the answer is in some ways, yes. I mean, it does geometric quantization. You could think of it as encompassing also fractional powers of uh, different operators, I suppose, and study thereof. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of what I can say to that. So, yeah. I guess we could comment on, this is a kind of a typical question, but I think it, it 
definitely requires comment usually you know folks are asking about the direct application of these topics now what how do we answer that for them i think it's important to we uh to for me them. okay no, so in general then people want to know what the direct practical applications of these topics are and i think some general remarks are helpful okay so, as i said uh, operator algebras, even in entanglement and CP maps, like they are said. So there are of two kinds. One are of finite quantum systems, another are of large quantum systems. The one that are of large quantum systems will, of course, be used to study gravity. The one at finite quantum level that people are, they, they are also relevant in physics, but they can be used in many places. I mean, at the end of the day, the CP map actually tells you, I mean, even the identity map as a CP map between matrices tells you what is the right space to represent a matrix. I mean, most of us think of matrices as acting on an MNC, a N by N matrix, act on an N dimensional space, but that's not right. You should not act it there. It should act on an N squared dimensional space. And that been given by the trivial channel, let's say. Right. I think, I, think, I think also this is kind of funny. Folks are asking about this. I think it's sort of similar to asking, what can we use this for in my everyday life or in my banking or whatever? A lot of these things are just like anything else. How can I use? You might ask the same thing about an electron microscope. You know, you can't use an electron microscope because you're not studying something sufficiently um, advanced. So these things are useful for very advanced and very subtle topics that are at the cutting edge of quantum physics. And so really uh you're not going to see like it's not going to make a better toaster let's put it that way so these things it's just a very similar um situation it's kind of hard for us to explain the direct practical applications for this a physicist we could explain it to a maybe a physicist working in an area like quantum computation but it would be difficult to uh to shed light on this uh, for its practical applications for the general public beyond that i think that's probably fair to say right guys i mean right I mean, after all, these are tools made to apply for some other tools. Right. Right. I've got Isan on here. I know Isan Patri. <laughs> yes. How does one visualize singular masses as it, as, as it is a seemingly unnatural object? <laughs> okay. So thanks for the question, Isan. Uh, Singular masses are not at all singular. They are singular to some people, those who have named them. Singular masses are the most regular ones because they appear in any, let's say, let, let's come in the context of two one factors. They appear in any two one factor. They are sitting, so singular masses are more like common man. They are, they are everywhere. Whereas a Cartan massa is more like an elite. When it sits in a special place, it determines lots of structures about the algebra itself. Uh, so singular masses are more like random objects. As I said, they correspond to weak. I mean, if you, for example, the best way to view a singular massa is when you see the two one factor or the von Neumann algebra is coming out of a cross product with respect to an abelian group. The moment that happens, you just see that the singular massa correspond to the weakly mixing component of the action. And uh, so to a very general person who has not done any of this, the, the, way to, the way to see is these masses are like sort of hills, little hills in a broader landscape of hills. On, inside this broader landscape, if you close your eyes and place your hand randomly on a smaller object of the hill, you will find a singular muscle. So that, 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 that's how they are. There is nothing singular about it, but people have named them that way. So, uh, <clears throat> and of course the name Kartan comes from Maximal Toros in Lee group. So, well, that, that had a genuine name of a mathematician, but here it did not come that way. So people have named them singular, but yeah, them, they are not singular in any sense. I mean, they're pretty cool guys. <laughs> Look through the. Here's another question. Can we use quantum operator algebras to perform quantum cryptanalysis logically to prove the security of quantum systems? Okay. I don't know the answer to this in detail, but I'll tell one thing. 
many people do quantum stops. Now, depending on their application, like Abramian said, he wants to study a self-adjoint operator somewhere that is related or coming from physics. He, uh, Sumesh says that he has a CP map that goes between matrices. So that takes operators to operators as well. And I have something else, like if you give me a single operator, I am not so much happy. I want an army of operators around me to do the <laughs> game. So the point is, depending on applications, sometimes people think of quantum objects as matter of one operator, matter of one matrix, matter of a couple of matrix and so on. Some even say the statement, you want to know quantum computing, you have to understand linear algebras. But in the way, the broadest data that you can have out of a quantum system is a von Neumann algebra. Okay, it's analogous to if you are having a genome sequence pasted on your blackboard, then is that, you can ask the question, is this sequence of some, some big thing where it lives? So such a thing is an operator algebra, it's a collection of so many objects, so many operators. So single operator there who studies, they also do quantum stuff. But the point is, if you want the entire large data around you, you have to arrive at a von Neumann algebra. So every time, every time you utter the word quantum, you have said something about a von Neumann algebra. Whether you want to use it or you don't want to use it, that's up to your choice, but you have said about it. So that's how useful it is. It, it could be the simplest algebra, like the algebra of complex numbers or the simplest non-commutative algebra, like the algebra of two cross two matrices, but still it's a von Neumann algebra and you're using it. It's a nice intuition there. Suppose if you want to think about functions, suppose you've got a bunch of points. Now think of a diagonal matrix or a matrix with only entries along the main diagonal. You can think about this as sort of something which uh, each point along the diagonal is a point in the space. And so a diagonal matrix, the functions only talk, points only talk to themselves. But say you have a two by two matrix and you put something on the off diagonal. Now this gives a way for one of the entries of the matrix to talk to the other entry. That's exactly when you do quantum. That's why these matrices and these von Neumann algebras arise because now you have ways of communicating between the different points. They produce these non-classical correlations. You can't turn this you can't have an underlying space of hidden variables that allows you to talk from one, one point to the other. It's something that immediately becomes about matrix algebras and operator algebras. Okay, here's some fun questions here. With the geometric quantization, is it possible to unite quantum mechanics and general relativity? <laughs> I think it is more through operator algebras. Again, I think the answer is somehow, so geometric quantization has a very specific, I mean, geometry enters in very specific ways, right? I mean, it's not just putting anything geometric and anything quantum together necessarily. Yeah, so, uh, so this is why I try to indicate the ways in which geometry actually enters quantization. In, 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 so to make it the geometric quantization. Uh, but of course, in all fairness, I will say that I don't know enough physics to answer the question at all. I mean, completely. <laughs> so, uh, but I would think not. So this is this would be my answer. So. Let's see what else do we have here. I had one here a minute ago. Uh, someone was asking about what completely positive maps look like? I don't remember where that problem went. But. I mean, it could be an automorphism, for example, the simplest one. Yeah. It could be a conditional expectation to a subalgebra. Mm. Uh, it could be like, a it's usually in the, in the world of matrices, it's easy to write, like these are composition of Krauss operators. So you take Finitely, you take a bunch of operators, Ti on your whatever Hilbert space you have. So you do Ti, X, Ti star, and then sum them up. That gives you a completely positive map. This is a Krauss decomposition, and all of them look like that in the world of matrices, right? Yeah. So when you are moving, okay, that question actually can be nailed out on the wall if you are asking in finite dimensions. 
Now, if you come to infinite dimensions, we have to scratch our hair. What are all those? And some of us, we are actually trying to even figure out what are all those uh, we are involved. So the full picture in the infinite dimensional case is not answered even 50%, uh, even let's say. It's full open. I guess roughly there's a thing, isn't there, um, there's the old question about wave function collapse from physics, where you have, in physics, if you look at the Schrodinger equation, you look at the axioms of class, you know, ordinary quantum mechanics, you have unitary evolution, right, where the thing evolves by a unitary conjugation. That's an example of completely positive maps, a unitary uh, evolution of the Schrodinger equation. Plus, you've got wave function collapse, which they call in the popular literature, which is when you apply a projection. A projection loses information because you've cut out and killed off some dimensions. And the Steinsprings theorem that was mentioned is a way of saying you can inflate your, whenever you have a CP map, a completely positive map, you could look at it on an inflated or larger space by pumping in extra dimensions. And up on that bigger space, it will look unitary, but then you cut it back down to the original space. And so that's what basically you can get a general idea. This doesn't make it easy because as Kunal mentions, you go infinite dimensions, now all of a sudden things are crazy. But, um, but roughly, that's a way you can describe what they look like. In a larger space, it's a unitary evolution that's been cut down by a projection, so information will be lost in the lower dimensional space. Right, right. Steinspring's theorem. Yeah, Steinspring's theorem. Uh, okay, what is this now? This guy's still running something. It would be helpful if analysis of quantum theory is explained for one real-time application if possible. How about this? Your computer. All of quantum theory relies on von Neumann algebras, as Kunal has said. I'm going to, sorry, I just have to answer this one because everybody's like, what's the real time application? Well, you don't have quantum tunneling. You don't have solid state physics. You don't have solid state physics. You don't have the computer that you're watching this on. Everything, 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 everything is about quantum mechanics. And the original picture of quantum mechanics like this comes from the 1950s by von Neumann. This is the, the question of connection with the diagonalization of matrices happened in the 1950s. And this mathematics is uh, very, very important for the evolution of you know, modern solid state. Just about everything is tied to this. This is highly foundational work. So asking for practical applications, uh, it's more helpful, I think, to imagine what the world would look like without it. And we have problems then. <laughs> Anytime you have quantum tunneling happening at PNP, you know, uh, NP junctions inside solid state physics, that phenomenon doesn't happen without a, without a Hilbert space phenomenon, a Hilbert, state, Hilbert space picture. You don't have tunneling through potential barriers. That won't happen. So transistors don't work if you don't have this theory, right? We're just fully, uh, yeah, modern science, modern physics, modern computing, all of these things, all of these things rely entirely on this. Sorry, guys, I had to answer that one. No problem. Maybe we, we, we ask people a question. What yeah, is okay. the application of time? Everybody knows right, right, right. the meaning of time. They have to come here at a time. The class begins at a time. The bus starts at a time. The flight will start at a time. Can you define what is time? What is really time? If I say that I will start the class at seven o'clock in the evening, does that mean that whenever the hands, hands hand comes at, I mean, the hands of the clock come at seven and 12, we have to begin the class? The Think about it physically. You try to answer this question, you will slowly, slowly, slowly <laughs> come to where we began. Well, this is connected directly to the, the study of black holes. People are wondering about the structure of the universe and the UNRWA temperature or the UNRWA, you know, the black hole radiation, the radiation that you see and uh, Stephen Hawking's work, that stuff. All of that is related to the Hawking radiation. This is all related to type three factors, right? And to the, into the UNRWA temperature. The, 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 this is the thermal time stuff. You need to do type three factors in order to understand thermal time. So if you want to understand black holes, you've got to understand operator algebras. You just have to. Everybody, go look at this. 
our recent paper, you know, this recent papers and, you know, operator algebras appear in the same journal as uh, where Hawking publishes information about the Hawking radiation. This is CMP, you know, this is what... If you like quantum physics, you like, you know, modern cutting-edge physics, then you have to know something about operator algebras. How quantum mechanics is connected to the black hole? Well, that's a big question, right? Big question. It's connected to something called holography. It's something. It's connected to something called black hole entropy, where you, uh, uh, when I say holography, you know, you're looking at the entropy of the uh, event horizon of a black hole. The information loss and the entropy is connected to the physical, you know, the uh, evolution of time that comes from these type three one factors. These type three factors. It's amazing. It's a remarkable thing, actually. If you have a type 3 factor, it comes with a canonical time evolution. So the minute you construct this type 3 factor, which is an object, which is just you take a unitary representation, which is a set of symmetries, and you look at the symmetries of those symmetries, immediately a time evolves, and the time is canonical. So somehow, the, 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 the slogan here, the mantra, is that time comes from non-commutativity. So we wouldn't be living in a static universe if it weren't for the fact that quantum mechanics is there. So time itself comes out of non-commutativity. The minute you have non-commuting variables, a time evolves, and that time is canonical. And it's a semi-group, so it only goes one way. So the arrow of time is a big question in physics. But one possible answer to that arrow of time is that it comes from the non-commutativity of nature. And that also is connected to holography and the black hole entropy. It's a large question. What else do we have here? Uh, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Can quantum non-locality used to send non-local signals faster than light and backwards in time? What? Can you, can, is it, can quantum non-locality, so, so I think that this is a typical con confusion between local, loca locality and like and, and causality type things, right? This, but we will have uh, backward time, right? Right, and you said you can get if you can send signals, if you use non-locality to send signals faster than light and backwards in time. Right, it's because right. there's like a confusion and entanglement. You usual ideas. I like I like the explanation that if you take you know if you go in your sock drawer in the morning, you take a pair of socks and you leave one in your bed and you go take the other one to work, right? <laughs> it's more like that. You know, you know where, you know, I have one sock here, the other one's got to be over there. It's not really like they're entangled. It's more like that. It's not because I sent a signal from one sock to the other sock. It's that they were entangled rather than the light is transferred. The signal, locality doesn't, 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 doesn't assume tachyons, no. <laughs> oh, look at this. Abdul Jabbar K already signals affected to human brain cells. How does safe and quantum computing move to the next level? Any safe there? I don't really know what the question is, but you should read the work of Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose talks about the brain cells being places where quantum computation and wave function collapse happen. Cute. Uh, let's see, what do we need? We need some more questions. Maybe we have answered most. Maybe we've answered all of them. I guess that's fine. We got 70. I don't see any new ones here that are. Someone says black hole is just theory. I beg to differ. Some questions <laughs> are found. posed actually by engineering students. They want to. I see, I see. Uh, but they will find there are many. Okay, someone asking like what is, what, what are the uses or helps of quantum mechanics in engineering? So I request them to go for another uh, series of webinars from IIT that is quantum science and technology. They will find more better answers there of making quantum devices and so on. So engineers should contact, I mean, be in that seminar to get more data for, uh, I mean, for those kind of questions. There's one more here that you guys can answer. Is the uncertainty principle applicable for quantum operators? What is the meaning of a quantum operator though? Any operator carries with itself something quantum. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. There is an uncertainty principle for when it comes to operators. Even in the context of appropriate von Neumann algebras, 
uh, there's nothing called a quantum operator unless you want to choose operators at random by assigning probabilities from some distribution. Bounded operators, bounded yeah, operators. So I think probabilities. that question is sort of a little vague. Yeah. On the other hand, even the classical Fourier analysis uncertainty principle, you know, it is yeah. an operator. The Fourier transform is an operator. Yeah, exactly. So it is a statement about operators in that right. sense. So. Right. Right. There's a very general, uh, the uncertainty principle is really an artifact of the Fourier transform, as you say, right? It's like you take a, if you take a wave packet, you take the Fourier transform, if you get a thin wave packet, it becomes fat. There's a, you yeah. know, there's yeah. a, I don't see any other ones here. Oh. Uh, well, there, there is one question I did. Maybe they should ask it to a physicist in a physics webinar. Does, does not the quantum theory contradict general and special theory of relativity when it comes to black holes? I think physicists will answer that better. It, here it's all about the math involved. Even if it does contradict or it does not, operator algebra stays. I could say something about that, actually. The whole okay. point is that general relativity requires points. It requires, like, when we talk about those matrices, it, it, in order to talk about geometry classically, you need to know about points. Quantum mechanics, the minute you have a non-commutative setting, poof, the points vanish. So right. we need some way of thinking about space that's more, in fact, that's like the motivating reason for studying operator algebras and non-commutative geometry is that you need properties of, it's like, I think that's, um, you want to look at sort of, instead of looking at the points themselves, you look at the, the frequencies that are associated to them, right? The frequencies associated to the space rather than the points. So there are problems. So what you need to do is phrase everything about general relativity in terms of frequencies and the associated algebras and forget the points. Nature, <laughs> Nature does not have these geometric points, right? So we need a better theory that will talk about both the quantum theory and general relativity. Both of them are super successful theories, right? But the fact is we don't have the right language, the right level of abstraction to talk about both of them compatibly. They don't contradict one another, but what they strongly signal is that there's another theory which does not require the points. And this is why we have, why the, this is the deepest importance, I think, of studying operator algebras is that we can get this instinct about geometry when we don't have classical geometry. We don't have access to these points. Uh, so, John, I think we have answered most of what they have asked. So maybe okay, we would like to, to close by asking our GE office. Uh, Sir, I hope, I mean, we have answered sufficiently. I think it is time for us to close. So can you uh, help us? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, John, by the way, thanks for all the, all the comments. My pleasure. Uh, you guys do questions. great work. Keep it up. Yeah. Keep up the good work, guys. <laughs> Yeah, so. so do we simply leave? Thanks all for uh, involving me in this. It was very informative. I'm going to leave now. I'll talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor. Like on behalf of uh, IIT Madras and Office of Global Engagement, I would like to thank uh, the speaker and moderator and all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, John. <laughs>